Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. Got a comment? Email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And uh, you can uh, become a fan on Facebook, Facebook facebook.greatdetectives.net. Reminder, on Podcast Alley, it's a new month, so if you voted in June, please cast your vote in July. Well, it, as a start of a new month, too, I'm going to go ahead and let you know what our movie will be. It'll be on July 11th, and uh, it will be My Favorite Brunette. Uh, it's a detective comedy starring Bob Hope and Dorothy L'Amour, featuring uh, Peter Lorre. Uh, also has Alan Ladd, which it's uh, fantastic to see Alan Ladd. Uh, on screen after hearing him so much in uh, Box 13. There's not a whole lot of uh, public domain stuff that uh, Lad is in. So uh, be looking for that on the 11th. Also some cameo, a cameo from Bing Crosby that uh, you want to sit through the film to, to uh, and not miss. Well, before I do get started, I do want to uh, remind you about Netflix. Netflix brings you a world of entertainment uh, regardless of what your taste is, whether it's classic TV, whether the old movies of great stars like Bob Hope or uh, Basil Rathbone, uh, or if uh, you want to uh, uh, watch uh, episodes of canon, uh, you've got a great choice in Netflix. Uh, Netflix gives you access to 90,000 titles, and you can try it out for two weeks of free unlimited new movie rentals. Go to netflix.greatdetectives.net or go to greatdetectives.net. Click on the Netflix link. All right, well, let's get into today's episode of Sherlock Holmes. This one's called Murder in the Casbah. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by short wave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And as for me, well, I'd like to tell you that a time like right now is the perfect time for a glass of Petri California Port. After you've had a good dinner, boy, Petri Port is a real topper. That rich, deep red Petri Port is really an extraordinary wine. Even its color is different. And as for its flavor, well, it'll take a better man than me to describe that. Petri Port is a hearty wine, sure. And every other quality that you look for in a good port, you'll find in Petri Port and then some. Try Petri Port by itself or serve it with fruit, with nuts, or with cake. But share it with your friends, will you? Because you can serve it proudly. After all, it is a Petri wine, and that name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now let's visit our old friend and host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Good evening, Doctor. Settle yourself down and get your pipe going. Thanks. Doctor, last week you told us that tonight's story took place in the Casbah at Algiers. Yes, the Casbah. I remember it as the place of countless streets winding up and down, past colorful cafes where a hundred tongues were spoken, and often a street would end in shadowy darkness which a man would be foolhardy to enter alone. Yes, Mr. Bartell, that was the Casbah that Sherlock Holmes and I knew... In that winter of 99. Well, how did you happen to be out there, Doctor? Well, do you mind if I tell you the story from the start, Mr. Bartell? It really began on a wintry night in Baker Street at the conclusion of a strange murder mm. in Montrevor Castle. A charming young girl sat on the sofa of our lodgings in Baker Street and talked to her. But, Mr. Holmes, you can't say you'll have nothing more to do with the murder. Mr. Fredfield, I found the true murderer of the Dowager Countess and committed suicide. Surely the case is ended. Yes, Mr. Holmes, you found the real murderer. But now I want you to find the unfortunate young man who fled England five years ago when he was suspected of the crime. This is a new development, Miss Stetfield. Please tell us about it. It's Douglas Milton that I'm talking about. Oh, yes, yes. He was the heir to the title, wasn't he? Yes, Mr. Holmes. He was a sensitive, artistic boy, and, and when he knew that he was under suspicion, he ran away. Mm -hmm. Of course, everyone regarded his flight as an, as an admission of guilt. 
That is, until you found the real culprit, Mr. Holmes. I imagine, Miss Tretzel, that your interest in the missing boy is not entirely, shall we say, uh, altruistic? I'm in love with him, Dr. Watson. Oh. We were engaged to be married when he ran away. Mr. Holmes, you've got to find him. He must know that his name has been cleared and that he's inherited the title. Miss Tretfield, uh, have you any direct news, any letter from your fiancé since he left five years ago? None. Any clues as to his hiding place? Only this. It's a painting I received anonymously a year after he had left. Oh. It was sent from a forwarding address in London. Here it is, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. It's a small oil painting. Very good one, too, I say. Yes. The splendid sense of composition and his use of color is unusually brilliant. You recognize this painting as the work of your fiancé, Miss Stretfield? I'm certain of it. Yes. Wonderful use of color. Serve the delicate shadings of that sunset and the brilliant green of the oasis. This scene is extraordinarily reminiscent of the desert in North Africa. Yes, yes, that's what made me say I was certain he'd gone abroad, Mr. Holmes. But why should he go to North Africa? A good place, Watson, for an Englishman who imagines himself to be escaping justice. Remember the foreign legion is stationed there. You think he might have joined the legion, Mr. Holmes? All right. It would seem logical. No question to ask to those who join it, and its colorful obscurity might easily appeal to a young fellow in trouble. Hello. What is it, Holmes? Huh? Well, quite a few grains of sand between the canvas and the frame here. Miss Tretfield, do you mind if I pry the canvas loose? Do anything you like, Mr. Holmes, if it gives you any clue to Douglas's whereabouts. Give me your penknife, will you, Watson? Uh, Thanks, old chap. Uh, Here we are. Can you see anything? Uh Uh-huh. Look. The word sheriff. An Ella Froon. A stamped here. Sheriff is probably the framer's name, and Ella Froon is a town some 50 miles from Algiers. That settles it. Miss Stratfield, I accept your case. Watson and I will go to Africa and try to find your fiancé, Douglas Newton. Monsieur Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. I have heard of you so often, but I never thought I should see you here at the headquarters of the Foreign Legion. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Well, Colonel Lepresson... I'm uh, trying to trace an Englishman who has been missing during the past four years. I have reason to believe that he uh, might have joined the Legion. Yeah, I shall look in my records. Uh, let me see, four years ago would be 1895. Uh, if Sherlock Holmes is tracking him, then I suppose he was in trouble in his own country. If he was in trouble, he might easily have come to us. We ask no questions. 97, 90, ah, 95. In that year, three young Englishmen joined us. One of them died of dysentery two years ago in Sidaraji. One of them deserted 18 months ago, and we have been unable to trace him. The third is my adjutant, who brought you into my office just now. And he is, I would say, about um, three inches shorter than Douglas Milton. And men do not uh, shrink from the foreign legion, eh, Colonel? <laughs> they do not, Miss Jones. When the <laughs> fellow who deserted must be our man. Unless it's the one who died of dysentery. Colonel de Brisson, how would you advise us to set about trying to find a deserter? Monsieur Holmes, there's only one place in Algeria where a man can hide from the Foreign Legion and remain here. Oh, and what's that place? The Kasbah in Algiers. Then that's our destination, Watson. Uh, be very careful, please, gentlemen. The Kasbah is a place where the law is exiled. The police have no jurisdiction there. The only rule is that of strength, violence, and threat. We'll be very cautious, I assure you. Goodbye, Colonel Brisson, and thank you for your help. <laughs> I must say that I think Colonel de Brisson rather exaggerated the dangers of the Caspar. <laughs> I suppose you're going to tell me this cafe is the headquarters for a dope smuggling ring or white slaving or something. Its ramifications are even more extensive than those you've mentioned. You're joking, Holmes. I assure you I'm not, old fellow. What? My old friend Juamel is chief of police officers. When I told him our mission, he advised me to come here. A 500 franc note and the proprietor can obtain any and all information regarding the underworld. For as little as 200 francs, you can arrange a murder. So that gives you some idea of the relative values of the Caspar. Good Lord, then you've already spoken to the proprietor? Oh, yes, yes. A charming scoundrelly fellow by the name of Rafi. I gave him 500 francs and asked him to set his underworld grapevine in motion to see whether an Englishman living in hiding here in the Caspar could be found. And I thought we'd come here for a quiet meal. <laughs> here comes Rafi now. Let's hope he has new for us. Here we are, Rafi. Come and sit down, won't you? Rafi works fast, does he not, Mr. Holmes? 
Uh, your friend is... My friend knows that you're working with me. We'll be found out. A, a drink first. The tongue of Rati is parched. <laughs> Would you have me die of thirst before I give you my news? Uh, vermouth Kashi. Vivi, Vivi, Rafi. Ah, you have news for me, then? Uh, but yes. Good, what is it? First, you will pay me more money, no? Uh, but I gave you 500 francs. You said that you'd do the job for that. Uh, can I help it if some tongues are more costly to make wag than others? <laughs> it took the 500 to get the wag. Am I to have nothing for my own trouble? Votre vermouth Kashi, Mr. Rafi. Ah, good, good. Uh, the gentleman will pay for it. <laughs> There you are. Merci, Missy. I will drink to your health, gentlemen, both of you. You will pay me more money, no? But my friend's already given you 500. You should stick to your bargain, my good fellow. My information is a bargain at 750 francs. It would be a bargain at 1,000, but Rafi will let you have it for 750 oh, because he likes you. You will give it to me, no? And if I refuse? <laughs> Then you get no information, and uh, perhaps I spread news in the Casbah that makes it uncomfortable for you gentlemen to be there. Oh, it's Scott. This is blackmail. Uh, I get the money, no? <laughs> You're a scoundrel, Rafi. Of course I'm a scoundrel. <laughs> Here's your money. An information? There is an Englishman hiding here in the Casbah. I do not know his name, but he's tall and fair-haired. I cannot tell you where he lives. But if you go to the cafe of a thousand sides, you will find a girl who sings there. A girl who sings like a nightingale. Her name is Aisha. And she can lead you to your Englishman. A girl named Aisha. In the cafe of a thousand sides. That is right. I would suggest that you go there in disguise. Two well-dressed Englishmen might find themselves in trouble. For a small fee, say 200 francs, I will escort you there oh, myself. Thank you, thank you, yes. I, I think we can manage by ourselves, Rafi. Oh, uh, if your business is concluded quickly and time weighs heavy on your hands, Rafi can take you to some places of rare interest. Dancing girls that wither one's eyeballs with their beauty. <laughs> For 500 francs, gentlemen... Uh, thank I... you, Rafi, thank you. I have a feeling that time will not weigh heavily on our hands. Good night. You work too hard, gentlemen. You should learn how to play. Good night. <laughs> On my soul, I think that fellow's the biggest blackguard I ever met. <laughs> I quite agree, old chap, but he is amusing. Uh, by the way, Holmes, uh, don't you think that when this case is finished, we might have a time on our hands? Oh, Watson, you're incorrigible. But I think... Watson. What is it? Got the man sitting over in the corner by himself. Oh, Joe, yes, it's... His face seems familiar. We've seen him before somewhere. Of course we have. His name is Oliver Leeming. We met him at the inquest on the Montrever case. So we did. Now, what on earth do you suppose he's doing here in the castle? Mm. Not on a holiday, I'm sure. Mr. Oliver Leeming, if you recall, is a, a cousin of Douglas Milton's. The man, the man we're searching for. If Milton were ever declared legally dead, Mr. Leeming over there would uh, inherit the title. It looks to me as if we're not the only people in the Casper who are searching for the missing heir. That's true, old fellow. Come on, let's go and talk to the gentleman. Mr. Oliver Leeming, I'm very glad to meet you here. Well, well. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, won't you sit down? Thank you. World's a small place, isn't it? Or has somebody said that before? I wondered if you'd spot me over here at the corner. Oh, you saw us, Of course. But you seem to be in such deep conversation with that scoundrel Rafi. <laughs> I didn't like to disturb you. Very considerate of you, I'm sure. Why are you here, Mr. Leeming? Oh, I'm making a business trip. This is my day off. As I recall it, um, you're in the publishing business. Correct. What a memory you have. Yeah, it know. seems peculiar that you should uh, be on a business trip here. Are you planning on opening a publishing house in Algiers? Or are you uh, searching the Casbah for new authors? Yes, why not? I'm a great believer in encouraging new talent. Mr. Leeming, why don't you admit that you're here for the express purpose of trying to find your cousin, Douglas Milton? Mr. Holmes, you've discovered my secret. The great Sherlock Holmes and his watchdog have their eager eyes on me. They know that I succeed to the title if Douglas Milton dies. Yes, Mr. Leeming, we know that fact. And you have fathomed my plan to find Douglas before me and kill him so that I may inherit the title. How lucky I am to meet you in Mokasba, where you cannot arrest me. <laughs> well, it's a race against time, gentlemen, but I have a head start, as you will soon find out. Goodbye. 
And the best of luck to you. <laughs> Extraordinary fellow. He's joking, of course. I believe not, Watson. I think he labors under the physical belief that the best method of discounting the truth is to state it as boldly so that it will not be believed. Great Scott, then we must work fast. Yes, old chap, we must. I'm sure that we're entrance in a race against death. We must get back to the hotel and into our disguises as quickly as possible. After that, we shall visit a young lady named Aisha in the cafe of a thousand sighs. And I'm certain, Watson, that it will be the first time two men have ever entered the Kasbah for the express purpose of preventing a murder. We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just about a second, which gives me time to remind you that if you like the flavor of big, plump, juicy Muscat grapes, you'll love the flavor of Petri California Muscatel. What a wine. Petri Muscatel is the perfect after-dinner wine... It looks good, smells better than it looks, and when it comes to the taste department, well, you never tasted anything like it. For a really good wine, remember first Petri, then Muscatel. Petri Muscatel. Well, Doctor, I can hardly wait to hear what happened next. You and Sherlock Holmes went back to the hotel, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Hotel Holmes quickly adopted the disguise of an Arab guide, while I assumed the role of a tourist, and we started off on our search. Outside the cafe of a thousand size, we met with the rude shop. Good Lord. It's the fellow we met in the cafe. Yes, Oliver Lee Ming, with a knife between his shoulders. He's dead, Holmes. Shouldn't we get in touch with the police? What can they do? Remember, there is no law on the Kasbah. In any case, this man is beyond our help. Our job is to protect the living. Come on, old fellow. Let's go to the cafe of a thousand size and find this girl, Aisha. The girl, Rafi, says, sings like a nightingale. Comment je vois ceux qui chantent Je l'appelle ma petite bourgeoise Ma tante Kiki, ma tante Kiki, ma tante Kinoise Il y en a d'autres qui me font le doux yeux Mais c'est elle que j'aime le So, so that's the girl, Aisha. She, she's very beautiful. Don't forget our role of tourist and guide, old chap. Master, would you wish to meet this Aisha? Uh, very much indeed. I will see if it can be arranged, Master. Wait here for me, Watson. I'll see what I can do. Right, right you are, Holmes. Be careful, huh? Mademoiselle Aisha... What do you want, greasy one? There is an Englishman at the table over there. He wishes to talk to Aisha. Which one is he? The man who sits at the table in the corner. He is very rich, Aisha, and he admires you a great deal. He told me to give you this 500 franc note. So? Very well. You may bring him to my rooms. The door is at top of stairway, to the right. Good, Aisha. I fetch him. I shall be waiting. I will see you, Master. Follow me, please. Oh, very well. I hope you know that you're going to handle this, Combs. Don't worry, Watson. In this case, I think honesty will be the best policy. Well, I'm not so sure. This place is a thieves' kitchen if ever I saw one. You better be careful. First door to the right at the top of the stairs. And this is it. Call me. Oh, come and sit over here, Mr. Englishman. Greasy one. You may leave us. Mademoiselle, I... Uh... May as well tell you at once that I am not an Arab guide. My name is Sherlock Holmes. What do you want with me? Why you trick your way in here? Don't be frightened, mademoiselle. I can explain our mission in a very few words. My friend and I have come in search of an Englishman by the name of Douglas Milton. We have good news for him. What make you think I might know of him? A gentleman by the name of Rafi suggested that you might. What is your good news for this Englishman? That he has been cleared of suspicion of murder and that he is the rightful Earl of Montreva. That means when he knows this... He will leave the Kasbah and return to his country? Naturally, madame. I do not know this man. I have never heard of him. Here is your 500 francs. Goodbye. Not so fast, Aisha, mon petit chou. I've been listening from behind these curtains. Gentlemen, allow me to introduce myself. 
My name is Douglas Milton. Douglas Milton, we found you at last. Oh, excuse it's me, it's been a pleasure it's to have succeeded in my mission. How do you do, sir? Oh, this is very exciting. It is yes, I think the occasion calls for a drink. Uh, what will it be, gentlemen? Well, all right. I think a, a glass of port would be very nice, sir. Yes, it would be the most appropriate for toasting the new Earl von Trevor. Splendid, splendid. Aisha, bring glasses and a bottle of port and some uh, creme de menthe for me. You are not going to England. I will never let you leave me. Oh, stop being so melodramatic, Aisha. Please bring two bottles and some glasses. Very well. I am sorry. Mr. Holmes, I can't tell you how I appreciate your trouble in coming all this way to find me. But I must tell you at once, there's one problem that makes it difficult for me to leave this country. You see, I... I deserted from the Foreign Legion. Yes, 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 we know that, my boy. In fact, that's how we first got onto your trail. I shouldn't let that fact worry you, Mr. Milton. I'm certain the British Consul in Algiers can arrange to have any charges dropped against a peer of the realm. Oh, well, I, I never thought of that. Here are the bottles. You must excuse the glasses, gentlemen. Tumblers are hardly cooked, I suppose, but... <laughs> well, they won't spoil the flavor, I'm sure. Ah, two glasses of port and, uh... uh Cremed them out for me. Only three glasses, Aisha? Bring a glass for yourself. I do not wish to drink. And I insist that you do. Bring a glass, Aisha. Why should I drink if you are leaving? Mr. Milton, uh, do you know Oliver Leeming? Oh, of course, he's my cousin. Yes, he came here half an hour ago and threatened me. Did you also know that he's lying dead in the street? Murdered? Well, yes. Yes, I did. If we went in the cars, I wouldn't tell you this, but... Aisha stabbed him. She followed him when he left here. He killed him and then slipped back just in time to sing a song a few moments ago. Oh, you needn't look so shocked, Dr. Watson. Life is cheap in the Casper, and Aisha is a girl of violent passions. Come on, let's let's drink. A toast to the new Earl of Montreva. Oh, <coughs> excuse me, sir. You took the wrong glass. You were drinking my port. Oh, silly mistake. I can't bear port. Very English of me, I'm afraid, but, well, after all these years, I don't feel particularly English. In fact, I'll probably find it very hard to adjust myself to the old life when I go back. Or perhaps I should say, if I go back. Since you feel that way about it, Mr. Milton, why go? You can claim the title and the revenues of the estate without leaving Algeria. You could stay here and live on the income. I didn't realize that would be possible. Are you sure I could do that? Oh, yes, I'm quite certain of it. Hmm. But if you doubt my word, I suggest we all adjourn to the British consulate in Algiers. They can put you straight on the matter. That's a good idea. Let's go over there at once. Now, no, I've been listening to you, my friend. You are planning to leave me. Once you go from the club, I shall never see you again. Put down that knife, Aisha. I will not let you go. You belong to me. If you try to leave me now, I will kill you. Put down that knife, Aisha. You've done enough damage for one night. Why are you... Down, you fool. Put it down. Let me go. Let me go. She twisted the knife on herself as she fell. Holmes, help me turn her over. She's dead, Mr. Milton. Poor Aisha. It's a bloody path that leads to the Montrevor title, sir. I suggest that we see that the poor girl's body is taken care of. Then go to the British consulate without any further delay. Now that we're at the consulate, Mr. Milton, I suggest that you swear on oath that you are Douglas Milton, heir to the Montrevor estate. This gentleman is a commissioner of oaths. Then we can go in and see the consul. Very well. Now, now uh, rise the right hand, please, and repeat after me. I hereby solemnly swear that I am Douglas Milton, the missing heir to the Montrevor estate. I hereby swear that I am Douglas Milton, missing heir to the Montrevor estate. Thank you, sir. And now, if you'll sign the statement here, these gentlemen can witness it. There you are. Thank you, sir. And now, if uh, you gentlemen will sign. Yes, certainly. Uh, uh, no. Thank you, gentlemen. The document is now legal. Splendid. Now let's go over and see the consul. Not yet, my friend. Watson, this man is not Douglas Milton. What the devil are you talking about? There is no law on the Casbah, sir, so you cannot be punished for the two murders you committed there. But now that your avarice has tempted you here to Algiers, where you've been foolish enough to sign a false statement, I think we can at least settle you very nicely for desertion, false impersonation, forgery and perjury. Oh, what do you mean? The story should be obvious, old fellow. Oliver Leeming did track down the deserter. Recognition was uncertain after so many years, but at least it gave this gentleman the idea of impersonating the real Douglas Milton, a friend of his. You have a lively imagination, Mr. Holmes. The real Douglas Milton 
I had a dysentery two years ago in C.D. Rice. As soon as the idea of impersonating Milton was born, Leeming had to die. Your theories are very interesting, but you haven't a shred of proof. I say that I'm Douglas Milton. How are you going to prove otherwise? Very simply, my dear sir. Douglas Milton was a painter. A painter who excelled in the use of vivid colors. You, sir, suffer from the quite common malady of red-green color blindness. Less than an hour ago, you mistook a glass of port, which is red, for a glass of creme de menthe, which is green. I knew at once that you were an imposter. You're cleverer than I thought you were, Holmes. Goodbye. Here, here, come back. No, no, Watson. Don't go after him. But we can't let him escape, Holmes. Don't worry, old chap. He won't escape. I sent a message to Colonel DeBlanc. If you go to the window, I think you'll find that the consulate is being watched. The Legion has a long memory for desertion. I don't think he'll get very far. They got him, Holmes. Shot him as he was trying to run away. A just death for him. He lived a life of violence and treachery, Watson. It's only fitting that he should die in the same manner. Now, Doctor, that was a swell story, but... You know something? I, I wish you hadn't disillusioned me about the Casbah. I disillusioned you? Why, what, what do you mean? Well, before I heard your story, whenever somebody mentioned the Casbah, I'd always visualize a very glamorous, romantic sort of place full of beautiful women. Every one of them a ringer for Hedy Lamar. No. Yep. <laughs> and I could just see myself, handsome, dashing, going up to one of those beautiful girls and whispering in my fine French accent, Darling, you are sensational. You are lovely, gorgeous. Tell me. Have you ever tried Petri wine? It's wonderful. Well, you must admit, Doctor, that that is the truth. It is wonderful wine. It certainly ought to be. You're incorrigible. <laughs> After all, winemaking has been the business of the Petri family ever since way back in the 1800s. For generations, the Petri family has handed down from father to son, from father to son, the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And don't forget, because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, the letters P-E-T-R-I on a bottle of wine are the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. So no matter what type of wine you prefer, for any occasion, remember you can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Doctor, now I suppose you're ready to tell us about next week's story? Yes, and as soon as I have, I want you to meet a friend of mine. Friend? Yes. But first, Mr. Bartell, next week, I'm going to tell you an adventure in which, for once, Holmes came off second best. An exciting story of high society and romance. I call it A Scandal in Bohemia. Boy, that sounds swell. And now, what about your friend? Well, he's waiting at the microphone in San Francisco. He's Dr. Langley Porter... And he wants to tell us about something very important. Dr. Langley Porter. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Radio listeners, tonight in Italy there are thousands, many thousands, dying of cold and hunger. Babies, children, expectant mothers, old folks, dying for want of clothes, want of food. This organization, American Relief for Italy appeals to you to search your homes for anything that can be made useful for starving, freezing men, women, children. Clothing, layettes for babies, diapers, shoes, food, surgical supplies, but above all, clothes, clean clothes, fit to wear. Take them to the nearest fire station. That your gifts will reach the Italians who need them, you may be sure. Americans of this organization will distribute the packages in Italy through the Italian Red Cross, the Catholic Relief Organization, the League of Italian Women, the Confederation of Italian Labor, and the Italian government. In California, rationing has gone. Christmas comes. There, in Italy, death is on the prowl. Radio listeners, lives can be saved. It's up to you. Thank you, Dr. Langley Porter. I know that our friends listening in will do all that they can to help the organization American Relief for Italy. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Crooked Man. Music is by Dean Fossler. 
Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. This was a show where the uh, post-show festivities almost uh, overshadowed the show itself. Uh, first, you had Harry Bartell, and uh, you know I, I've heard both ways on the Petri One ads. Um, the in-show ads, you know, where he's sitting there talking with Doctor Watson. Those are sold by Harry Bartell. It's a fascinating bit of uh, showmanship uh, by Bartell as he uh, explains about uh, Petri wine. He cracked me up today. Really uh, well done. And then you had the war relief for Italy. And this was very, uh, you know, this is one of those uh, feelings of, wow, because we've just been at war with Italy. And here we're, we're like, this is a national radio show. And it's a priority to make sure we help out uh, help out these uh, poor people who are in this spot. Um, and it's a very uh, very moving uh, moment. The show itself, I thought, was fantastic with its uh, trip to the Casbah. What a great setting! Um, what a great setting for a story. Uh, and uh, there was so many twists there. I I kind of got a sense that the story was petering out at one point, but I. You know, when they were going over to the embassy, I kind of thought, no, 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 they, there's something more here uh, that we're about to get to. And I thought Holmes's clue was pretty clever uh, as to how he, he kept, caught that. You'd almost have to be a wine expert, though, but, uh, you know, I think Harry Bartell was there going, yeah, yeah, I know who <laughs> He's not the real guy. He couldn't, uh, you know, a good artist couldn't make that mistake. But good show overall. Got a comment here from Dan regarding my tribute to Art Linkletter. Yeah, he says I think sorely missing from contemporary media in general is theatricality, meaning a heightened sense of wit and a certain playing to the crowd that is appreciated by both writer, actor, and viewer. Outside of a few comedies, most everything is method acting and played to be at its most real, utmost realistic. I'm surrounded by reality. I don't need it so much in my entertainment. Uh, that's part of why I love uh, older, old-time radio and TV shows. It's for the sense the actors aren't really acting on stage and giving me a show. Uh, I like to be told a story and not always be shown reality. You know, I, I think that is, uh, that's a point. And, and any time you enter the world of the private detective, you're entering something uh, that is uh you know, for the most part, stage, because the real work of the private detective is not uh, all that uh, interesting. Uh, when you listen to the radio, you're right, there, there's a whole lot of uh, theatricality. You listen to uh, Burns and Allen, Bob Hope, Abbott and Costello. These shows were vaudeville routines done over the radio, um, and uh, with a, a very exciting way of uh, telling a story. So I, I think that there definitely has to be a place with this. Uh, and you, you think the one thing that too can bother me about some of the uh, reality uh, focus is if you're uh, is if you're saying this is reality, but you can also have a distorted perception of uh, reality, and then you get into some uh, some discussions that might be too philosophical. But I I, I appreciate your comment. Thanks so much, and uh, we uh, definitely. Uh, Definitely, we'll uh, continue to bring these shows to you. And uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. We'll be back tomorrow with yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And next Thursday, another episode of Sherlock Holmes. I got a common email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And uh, follow the show on Twitter at Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. <laughs>